of uh, the Great Panthers. Sandy, Sally Brown is now the executive director. Just raise your hand, just so people know. And Jan Bendor, who is uh, our wonderful camera person, is uh, the new uh, national chair of Great Panthers. But I am very pleased to say that I was asked to introduce Marion Wright Edelman. And I was delighted. Um, I truly enjoyed doing the research uh, because she is an amazing woman, and you all probably realize that, otherwise you wouldn't be here. And also because I personally remember so much of what you have accomplished. I'm also a very firm believer that one person makes a difference. Uh, she has been an advocate for disadvantaged Americans all of her life. And we passed out the flyer, and on the back were all the things that I wrote down to talk about and what she has done. So uh, I'm going to let you read it by yourself. Uh, but I do want to say that the Children's Defense Fund, which she was the founder and the president, is just celebrated its 40th anniversary. We're just, the Great Panthers are just a little bit older than you, 43 years. One of the things that I really uh, appreciate about all of her bios that I read was that she always mentioned that she's married to Peter Edelman, professor of Georgetown Law School, and that they have three sons, Joshua, Jonah, and Ezra, and grandchildren, two granddaughters and two grandsons. And I think that that's very, very wonderful. Also, because I lived in St. Paul, Minnesota. So I am familiar with that part of your family. But, um, uh, she has written a number of books, and many of you have heard how dynamic a speaker that she is. And so I am just going to quote from one of her books something that I think is really important and then turn over the podium to you. Uh, the best lesson in reading these, all of her, her biographical things, was about uh, lesson number 13 from The Measure of Our Success, which was published in 1992. And lesson number 13 was, be confident that you can make a difference. And she talks about Sojourner Truth, a role model. And I quote, and this is what Sojourner uh, Truth said. One day during an anti-slavery speech, she was heckled by an old man, old woman, do you think that your talk about slavery does any good? Why, I don't care any more for your talk than I do for the bite of a flea. At which point, she said, perhaps not, but the Lord willing, I'll keep you scratching. <laughs> <laughs> Mrs. Ellen goes on to write, a lot of people think that they have to be big dogs to make a difference. That's not true. You just need to be a flea for justice, bent on building a more decent home life, neighborhood, workplace, and America. Enough committed fleas fighting strategically can make even the biggest dog uncomfortable and transform even the biggest nation as we will and must transform America. Be a flea for justice wherever you are and in whatever career you choose in life and help transform America by biting political and business leaders until they respond. And I think that's exactly what the Great Panthers do, and I appreciate it. Thank you very much. Well, I wear Sojourner and Harriet Tubman around my neck. I used to wear them beneath my sweater, but I wear them and they keep me straight every day. These were two incredibly brilliant, but illicit slave women who didn't wear the Lincoln's freedom from slavery. Um, and um, 
they only met each other once, but they remind me every day of what you can get done if you have to. And um, you heard one of the wonderful quotes which showed German, she was never lacking a word. She could not read, but she could remember everything she heard. Um, and when it was hopeless to think about equality for women under slavery, she didn't step for a moment, and she was the first woman to sue to get our children back, even though slave women didn't really have a right to sue child was taken away from you. And Harriet Tubman was equally brave. Um, she um, could read, but she could read the way she read stars and knew which way there's more. And she got herself free, and then she had enough sense to come back and bring other people, because she knew it wasn't just about her. It was about something bigger than her. And it was a very self-serving individualistic nation um, that is all about me, not about us. Um, that's a really important thing to remember. Um, and so these women, if they could do what they did, we could do what we've got to do today, and we have got to do a lot today, because our children in our country, I think, is facing one of the most dangerous fronts of slavery. Um, and all of us are going to go down. I will say probably more than once today that um, the greatest threat to our economic, military, and um, military security does not come from us. It comes from our failure to invest in our children. Um, and so nothing is more important for all of us than I'm like you. Um, I want to make sure that my social security is strong and that my Medicare is going to be strong and that we have fewer and fewer workers. Um, and they put children in all of the So the job of what we've got to build the next movement around is this. Not that I do a business manager, I have to acknowledge your warm introduction and your current offices and board members, and I do hope we can really alive with ourselves because the promise of the American dream is that our children are do better than we did. And that's not happening. They go back. <coughs> wake up and take our responsibility. I am thrilled to be a grandparent and grandmother and I tell you I, I had three great I had three great sons. But when I had my first two granddaughters, I didn't know how lonely I've been all those years. <laughs> and um, and now I have two grandsons. I got one more son to get married, so I can get two more. But they have re-radicalized me all over again. And we must not leave the same mess we inherited <coughs> with segregation and caste system for our grandchildren to fight again. So let's get it together. <laughs> and you all have a self-interest because we have been working not only because we've been getting older, and I really thought I'd be out of business by now. We told the country um, it's, what is the right thing to do for children, but we shouldn't have to tell the country what is the right thing to do for children. Um, and then the self-interested thing, the economic thing to do, and all of our economic self interest they do the right thing, and I thought I'd be out of business by now. Um, but boy, we're working harder than we ever did, but let's finish it and make sure that we're leaving a better country with a better world. So I thank you for being here. I'm delighted to be here with you. I hope we can make common cause because we've got a movement. And we've got to fundamentally tackle the values and priorities of this nation, <coughs> which are all wrong-headed and we're moving backwards in very big ways. And you, as you were well aware, I want to appeal to you as grandparents, and for those of you who are there, because there's so many grandparents who are struggling to raise grandchildren um, without having to support. And we call them grand families. Um, and um, I just think that um, we've got a common self-interest. I am so pleased the progress that's been made in this country over the last decades in decreasing poverty among, among seniors. Um, only one in five, but we still, one in ten, if you're poor now, and you've had extraordinary progress. I'm not going to tell you what you already know. Our children deserve the same. I sort of said I love myself, I want mine, whatever, but I want my grandchildren. Um, they have the same chance not to be in poverty, and our child poverty rate is disgraceful. Um, with 16.1 million children in poverty, one in five, and the younger they are, the poorer they are. One in four of our black and Latino children are poor, um, more than, in fact. Um, and they're going to live already the majority of our babies. It will be the majority of whom we're going to have to rely on in a new era, um, and so we need to wake up. Got to end child poverty, but I will come back to that. And we can end child poverty. We do not have a money problem. We have a values and priorities. Here, here, here. Yeah. Yeah. And that's why I hope you all are going to be pit bulls up there on the hill. And uh, these 2.7 million grandchildren who are responsible for their grandchildren. Um, and I really admire those who are also in the you know that there are multiple households and there are many grandchildren who are living with their children in grandparent households. 
But I must say I've been very moved to have a number of meetings on Paley Farm, which is our movement building center down outside of Knoxville, Tennessee, with grandparents who are solely responsible for rearing their children in their own life. And they're on 20, you know, they're on 24-7. Um, and we were very delighted to have them be able to come for three days on a couple of occasions but we could cook with them and they could bond with each other and share their struggles. And this is hard work. I love my grandchildren, but I sure am happy when they go home. <laughs> they wear you out. And I don't know what you do, but we've been working very hard uh, with networks like you and with um, an intergenerational coalition um, to see how we can provide greater supports to um, grandparents raising grandchildren to keep more children home. And so I thank you for what you're doing, but you are the indispensable. So we've been using grandparents in some of our direct service programs with uh, very troubled children who uh, tear up the place with one particular instance in one school for last chance children we've had in Washington. Boy, do they tear up the school once a year. But they were just trying to see whether we were going to still love them. And but the most stable figures there were the foster grandparents and who were the people who kind of hung in. And so I just thank you. You're the most talented and educated generation of grandparents and of advocates and great practice, and I loved Maggie Cook. Um, and so I'm just delighted to see how we can make common cause and we'll talk a little bit about what we can do together um, today. I always end up by beginning to quote um, Albert Camus, who spoke to a Dominican monastery in 1947. Um, where he said, perhaps we cannot prevent the world from being a world in which children are tortured, but we can reduce the number of tortured children. He described our responsibility as human beings, if not to reduce evil, but at least to, not to add to it, and to refuse to consent to conditions which torture innocents. I continued, he said, to struggle against his universe, and which children <laughs> suffer and die. Dietrich Bonhoeffer, who was a great Protestant theologian, who I also quote in almost every speech who died opposing Hitler's Holocaust, believed that the test of morality and not only that on sense of the nation is how it treats its children. And America plunks Bonhoeffer's test every hour of every day. And while I see these speakers multiple times and they're in the brain them or whatever, I never get used to them. Just think about this. Think about America's future. And just think about how this can be true in the nation with the highest GDP and in our world. How we can let a child drop out of school every eight seconds of school goes from there. Um, I'm going to come back to the education figure. These are the children who are going to have to support our country and be in our military um, and um, be our politicians, but they couldn't do any worse than current politicians. <laughs> <laughs> and every eight seconds during the school day, a public school child drops out. Every 19 seconds, one of our children is arrested. Every 19 seconds, a baby is born to an unmarried mother. Every 32 seconds, our children are born, a child is born into poverty. Every 47 seconds, a child is abused or neglected. Every 70 seconds, and that's proved dramatically over the years, and now we have never enforced ACA, but we're going to be enforcing Medicaid um, and CHIP. Every 60, 72 sec every 70 seconds, a baby is born without health insurance. Every 82 seconds, born to a teen mother. We could fill up the city of Atlanta every year with children having children. You know, we've made progress. The figures are much better than they used to be. You don't have a chance in this society, though, if you're a single mother and a young mother who hasn't finished high school and now college in raising a child out of poverty. So it's still a very serious problem we've got to confront. Every two minutes, although we spend huge trillions of dollars every year on health insurance, we still have a baby born at low birth weight because we don't invest in prevention and early intervention. I mean, just, we're just dumb. Um, even if we're not <coughs> dumb, we're dumb. Uh, and we shouldn't be dumb. Um, and, um, but it is every, every, every three hours, a child is arrested for a drug offense. Every seven minutes, one for a violent offense, and we're going to come back to it. And every 20 minutes a baby dies before their first birthday, our infant mortality rate is way, way, way behind the industrialized and some non-industrialized nations, and I can't believe we can't do better. And I'm obsessed um, with um, gun violence. We've been publishing children and gun violence reports for 22 years. Um, 
Uh, we are focused on all children. We pay particular attention to black children, Latino children, disabled children, children who have no voices, particularly vulnerable, who are involved in the general court system. And we began in 1990 a crusade, then a crusade, to bring the black community together to deal with problems of black children because I was dumbstruck when my research director came up one day and told me that showed me a figure that 55.6% of all black children were being born and never married mothers. I said, that can't be true. Because if that's true, that guarantees the poverty in the next two generations. And he was never wrong, my genius uh, research director. And I almost collapsed. And I called together John Hope Franklin and Arthur Height, asked if they would come convene a meeting with key black leaders. I searched the country for two years for the best substantive black leaders. We brought them all for a week look at the crisis facing black children um, and we decided with no logic or say to leave that child behind. That's where those words came from, you know, with our trademark commission and we still mean it. Um, and um, we met two years in a row, but thankfully it's really important to do your homework, not only in the statistics, but you really need to do your homework by knocking on doors and talking to people and listening. I thought I knew what the black community solutions were and what their American goals would be. Well, I didn't. I, they would care about teenage pregnancy. They care about education. But the number one issue that we found in the first poll ever taken, black youth as well as black parents, is a multi-generational. We need to listen to our children. At least you're trying to tell us something. Um, and if they can't do it peacefully, they'll tell us unpeacefully. Um, but the number one issue is gun violence. Parents don't think their children are going to live to adulthood. And I remember Chicago mother who said, I can handle it when I daughter comes home the baby, I can't handle it, she comes on the bed. And young men, particularly, were never, they were totally, and we see the same kind of things today when we were focused groups, we've redone them within the last three years. They don't think they're going to develop them. Living to 17 to 18 to 20, and what do you got to lose? I and mean, there's a relationship between teen pregnancy and, and their fear of dying early. Is that that's the only way they see to end more challenges, that they try to have one baby that they care, and young men, to have some way of being remembered, but they don't. Census mentality, 60 blocks from here, 30 blocks from here, and in the neighborhoods, it's just extraordinary. And so when we repeated this set of polls, groups and polls by Peter Hart and Associates, three or four years ago in launching the second phase of the community say, again, gun violence and drugs was, was, was way up there at the top. Um, a child is killed or injured by a gun every half hour. And now the NRA hates us. They say, you don't call teenagers children. I do. And a, and a life is a life, a child is a child. And so we technically, in all of our reports, say children have teen. But we've seen what's happened here. We've lost um, more people in America to gun violence. More of us have killed ourselves, have killed other Americans in here. And we have lost in all the wars in all of our history. That includes the world, I guess, twice as that includes the Revolutionary War through the World War I and II, Vietnam, Iraq. We have lost more children. We lose about 3,000 every year. Um, then we've lost in Iraq and in Afghanistan. Uh, what is the matter with us? You know, the enemy is within us, and we really need to confront it. And children are facing violence every day. And I've been yelling at the back of the enemy saying, you know, where's our anti lynching movement? But we've lost 17 times in black children. Why is it that we can't stand up to the NRA? How are we putting them in charge of our defense policy? And we've got to love our children as much as they love their guns. The majority of the NRA though, also, though, um, really do agree with common sense gun safety measures. Nobody's trying to talk about hunting. I mean, nobody's trying to talk about self protection. We are trying to get good research that will show people if you keep a gun in the house, you're far more likely to be hurt by that gun than somebody you know. Um, that they don't have a gun in the house. And so trying to get gun violence research out there and the way and, and the science out there. And we had a wonderful, you had Gary Hall here. We had a wonderful children's family service last Sunday. And we had um, three incredible doctors. And we should go up, I think it's probably up on our website now. We had Dr. Mark Rosenberg, um, who ran the CDC and I thought, wow, I was Assistant Sur Surgeon General, David Satcher, who was our Assistant Secretary of Health and Surgeon General, and the head of the pediatrician, Dr. McCarrie. Um, and we were talking about gun violence as a major, major, major public health issue. 
how important it is now to bring the science to it so that we can begin to understand as we, after we learned about auto safety, um, how we were able to take measures that have saved hundreds of thousands of lives. And we've got to stop the block on an NRA um, research events um, so that we can make informed decisions about what we're doing. Um, and I hope that we can begin to get that done. We've also got to have it regulated like any other product. It is the only unregulated product by the Consumer Product Safety Commission. We regulate toy guns, we regulate teddy bears, we do not regulate something that kills 30,000 Americans. We regulate pajamas. Oh, pajamas, flammable pajamas. We regulate everything because they have blocked the regulation of guns. So I really hope that you all will become good panthers with us. We just need to growl at them and threaten them to stop letting our children die every year, be injured every half hour. And you know, these last killings are going on. I mean, I get it. In the town, we get all upset. And then in Arizona, we get all upset. And then we have an ADR, we get all upset. And then we go back to business as usual. Oh, we don't tell them. And I think it's got to be women. And older women and grandparents just said to stop. Um, and so that's work that we've got to deal with. Secondly, I do hope that we can begin to deal with child poverty, which is um, the stem of everything. I'm particularly concerned with the cradle of prison pipeline. Um, it's, gonna be, it's becoming the new American apartheid. One in three black boys born in 2001, one in six Latino boys is going to prison in his lifetime um, because of that dangerous intersection of race and poverty. Um, and children are getting poor. Many millions of them are living in extreme poverty. And we're going to be reproducing and re re replicating the tour that um, where we took Martin Luther King out to Robert Kennedy first. He's on the man through the Mississippi Delta in 1967. And some of the senators and other Democrat senators were attacking um, the Head Start program and the poverty program. <coughs> but we also took it as an example to show them that they went and knocked on these doors to see the malnourished children. Um, and the people with no income, and they were very relevant to today. Because Mississippi, after the summer project of 1964, was trying to make everybody come out of state. They didn't want voter registration, they didn't want anything. And one of their main tactics, after all the young white students left, was to shift over food stamps from free food commodities. Free food commodities were bad food, but at least they were free. And all the sharecroppers who lived in the virtual service system um, could not afford the $2 charge for food stamps. Um, and um, they were going hungry. There was no food. And um, babies were getting really malnourished. And so Robert Kennedy, there, everybody would come to Mississippi, I'd always take him up to see them. But he was the first one who commanded the press, and he got outraged because he said he'd never seen such poverty in America. Um, that's when I met my husband. And, um, and he came back the next day after seeing all these incredible poor children and seeing people with no income. Um, he went immediately to see our old friend and said, you got to get the food down there. Well, the people said, there are no people in America who have no income. Well, because they just saw it. Um, and so he sent his staff back to the department back down with Peter again and to retrace and visit all the families and to confirm what he did not believe that there are families with no income now in his defense, which I don't do very often. Um, the Agriculture Committee was then and still is to a large degree controlled by Southern segregation speaker, people who were very conservative, so he was about survival. Um, and so when I came back, um, that began a series of events and outside groups. The Field Foundation, God bless them, always funded it. I'm going to try to send in doctors and pediatricians back to Mississippi now and next summer to look at the children of Mississippi Delta. The food problem is huge. There are people with no income. And some of you may have seen Jason DePaul's front page New York Times story in December 2010 that said that there were 6 million Americans, 1 in 50, with no income, cash income. And they were totally dependent on food stacks um, to keep the wolves of hunger away from their doors. We know that often that's not happening. And with the absence of um, AFDC, it is the only real safety net program. And we're getting more and more stories about people selling their food stacks to keep their lights on. Um, and then children in the summer are having an enormous problem. Um, and on the weekends, they're having an enormous problem. But there's an 86% drop in food participation in children who got school lunches and breakfasts during the school year. And it's a 100% federally funded program. 
this facilitator program, and the states won't take advantage of it. The bureaucracies are awful, and that's one of our top new priorities is why in the world of COVID is 100% global money. Would you want to create jobs? And would you want to feed children? But they don't. And so hunger is back in our midst, and you know what they're doing on the hill, trying to cut food stamps and cut back on all the fundamentally inadequate already safety net programs. And so I'm glad you're here. We've got a lake of ruckus, so we've got to make a continuous ruckus. It can't be one time. We just need to worry them to death all the time and stop it. And there's something that's very fundamentally out of whack in this country in terms of the priorities. And I'm just looking at the figures that some of you are digging up. And I mean, this is a jobless recovery. The rich are getting richer. Wealth is at its near record levels. Income inequality is at its near record levels. And we're sitting here cutting children in this oppressive process, and cutting the poor, and cutting working class people. And we have to stop that. It's really um, something to out of whack. Just give you a few figures here. Um, in the United States, the 400, and maybe you've already heard these, because you're probably smarter than most people in the world are. But the 400 highest earning taxpayers earned as much as the combined tax revenues of 20 states, according to the most recent data. And that's 400 people earning as much as all the populations in 20 states. The United States is first among industrialized nations in defense expenditures and military exports. We're spending more than the next 10 highest nations who made us in charge of the whole world. $700 billion a year, that's what's on budget. And when I look at that F-35, it's going to end up yeah. being a trillion dollars and doesn't work and hasn't had research to support it. And you've got to look at what that can do to transform the lives of millions of families today. Use the word, so one more word they use that is politically engineered. And well, because now you know, it's impossible to stop. Well, you know, we need to figure something out. We don't need to be spending a trillion dollars on another revenue system. Um, we're going to make defense contracts rich when the company that threatens this moment is real. It's absolutely obscene, and we need to begin to reorder the priorities. And I don't want to go on. I don't I will just end with a few lessons which I use a lot. My sister, all pack rats in my family. And my sister said to me, old dippings and whatever, but she sent me a things about Noah's Ark. And I'm with that love. She all the things that we need to know in life. We can learn from the lessons of Noah's Ark. And the first is that don't, we got, don't miss the boat. Well, <laughs> <laughs> the strongest argument for doing something about children and making sure that we change these obscene things that we have here. This, this country is going to miss the boat for the future. The biggest national and military security system is the column the threat comes from in. 80% of our black and Latino children cannot read at grade level in fourth or eighth grade. And they haven't already dropped out of school by 12th grade, or this are. What are you going to do if you can't read in this, 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 this competitive world and this globalized world? 80%. And 60% of all of our children in all racial income groups cannot be able to do at grade level. This is a disaster. 75% of our young people, 17 to 24, can not get in the military because they cannot pass a literacy test or all of these have had a prior incarceration. Who's going to be in the military? And it's our greatest military threat. It doesn't apply. It's in some place without it. So we're going to miss the boat. And as we do the right thing. Very, very secondly, you need to recognize we're all in the same boat. And uh, you may not like these poor black and Latina children or these poor children of any color, but you're going to need them. And I'd rather have them supporting us rather than supporting them in prisons. Our states are spending on average two and a half times more for prison than for public school people. It's really dumb. And it's not making us safe. And uh, the disparities and the prosecuting people for drug offenses and others is unbelievable. And I go through the Mississippi prisons and their health prisons. Um, and it's full of illiterate young and older men. The average literacy level is, is, is fifth grade. What are they going to do in this economy? There's no jobs in Mississippi and in many ways, but like, what are they going to do with fifth grade literacy level? When I speak to the head, I go see the head of the Mississippi head of corrections, this young black man, he, you know, he's 50. He's <laughs> 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 looking younger than me all the time. Um, and I, I've asked him 
the last time I was there, what, what if you had one thing to do, what would you do? He said, I'm investing in early childhood, and I want you to please help us get an early childhood program in this country. That's my number one, two, and three priority this year, next year. Well, this place, these offices put in a proposal to invest $90 billion in mandatory funding to put in place an early care system and a universal pre-K system. And I'm now not trying to make it K because we are now holding kindergarten children accountable under the Common Core Standards. I'm for Common Core Standards, but you can't hold children accountable for them. We don't give them the support to we them. And we're simply going to move the achievement gap down further. Only 10 states provide universal kindergarten. And how are you going to test children in all 50 states on Common Core Standards and million other names on the story of the of colors? And so I, we're, we're saying we want true K, not true K. And it, isn't, it wouldn't make any sense to have a universal pre-K system which I'm for. If they're going to fall off the cliff, um, after that, we're going to do it. So we, I really hope you all are going to join us in, in your city. And we're hopefully going to get a bill to produce the Harvard and the Harvard and Congress George Miller. But it's not going to happen as we have. We, we make it happen. We're going to raise this and continue. It's going to have home visiting, and we've made some rooms today. Here I am for home visiting. This will be home visiting. We will for mothers. And we know what work. We know what work. The science has come a long way in a lot of these things. And it would really invest in the first three years of life, the zero to three. We've got to stop the zero to three, from five to four, from five. Children don't come in pieces. And so we're really trying to spend a lot of time getting our act together. So when we go up there, we are clear. And we're not each arguing for our own little piece of the pie, but we're arguing for the whole pie of children. And so we want a high quality continuum of care from zero through kindergarten. And everybody knows, and I'm right to know my broken record um, about kindergarten, about all this, is that if you get the first 720 days right, then you're going to get the rest of it right. If you don't have that strong foundation like that in any house, you can't, the children are going to be dropping down, they don't they can't keep up. And so this is the most important poverty prevention step we can make at education and investment and it's all overdue. Many of them, the most of the industrialized nations do it. So please, I hope you will become the integral child consistent part of this coalition to get an early care system in this country that's quality and put that $90 million. And I'm trying to get somebody to cost out how many jobs that would create. And we've got to get public sector jobs back on the agenda because private sector jobs have been disappearing. And so I, we've got a six million investment agenda that you We'll talk to you about all the other five I want you to remember the early childhood things right today. And that's what we got to get done over the next year. And we don't know what all the options are, but I really want to make sure I stay in touch and that you are going to be a difficult part of this. Grandmothers and grandchildren. The third thing, less than from Noah's Ark, is a plan ahead. It wasn't raining, but Noah built the ark. <laughs> and after all, as you know, and you know, we get to the next quarter, all we care about. And, and so I just told them um, that we will begin to get our uh, the children have all their childhood and they're cool today and they're hungry today and they're unsafe today and they need help today and so I will be able to take care of it. The last two quick things is that I um, don't listen to your critics and they say this because everybody's always got to reach out to do something just to kick her. I mean, well, what? Somebody keeps saying, well, why are you so radical about gun violence? And what is, what is, what, why can't you be more reasonable? I mean, what is a middle ground? I'm sure you shot my gun, so I don't care. When you see me sound more reasonable, then it's time to retire. Children should not be killed by gun violence. Children should not go without health care and immigration is in this country. Children should have the chance to be ready for school. And so this will be really reasonable. You don't want to be anything, don't say anything, you don't do anything, but it's not supposed to be totally, just ignore all the folks who say it can't happen. It's just, it can happen. So I just hope that you will do like Paul Germer. And the last, which is my favorite, because we all are waiting for Dr. King to come back. Dr. King's not coming back. He was hit. We're hit. And he understood because it wasn't leaders who made movements. He never started a single campaign. He responded to people who created things. This park sat down, and she wasn't an accident, and, but there was a woman behind her this park, too, who couldn't end up at ACP, and she went down to Holland and Hope School and got the training. It's Joanne Robinson, and she ran off those 30,000 people and decided she was going to call a boycott, 
And it was the people behind the scenes. And she was the one who got Dr. King chosen because he was a new boy in the block. She was a member of his church, and she didn't want all the baggage of the other preachers. Um, and so it was the women in Montgomery who were going about the Montgomery bus for kind of Dr. King had a great gift for encapsulating our dreams. But he responded. He started to sing campaign. He would still be in jail in Birmingham, the children of Birmingham were the only ones who stood up. He came out of the Birmingham jail and got no response. He asked the adults to go up to jail. None of them stood up. It's the children who stood up. The children are our secret centers. Um, and we took children to the hill twice, and that was a decisive thing. We took them up, and we were trying to get the child care block grant in 1990, and we took them up to see Mr. Ross and Cass, gave him the chairman ways and means. And he called us bullies. He called us children bullies. And he said, uh, we won. <laughs> and then secondly, we've been practicing our baby photo parades, and as you may know, even our friends threw out the chip bill from the Affordable Care Act. We were a dispensable chip. Um, because they're cheap to put in health exchanges, and we determined we were not going to be put in health exchanges. And now I'm still trying to get a study that will look to see before they get into health exchanges that they get comparable benefits at comparable cost to the parents. But at any rate, baby stolen grains were the only thing that sort of got us in. Nobody wanted to see it because they knew they were wrong and they knew they were going the way. And we took the baby stolen grains. Some of us told us that the, the security people, particularly all the black folks, we're not going to let anybody through the, 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 the You should have seen some of the black women helping those babies and stolen them get through with their balloons and all the other things they got out. But we have to be in there basically marched around the capital with 4,000 young people and children and baby stolen. And that got us the beatings we needed to sort of get in by the channel where check, check, check. And, but it makes a difference. Last thing is, you know, what, what power you have. Um, I love this lesson from Lois Ark, is that just remember that the Titanic was built by experts, the Ark was built by amateurs. You now know to deal with your politicians, understand the power of you, and that you really do have the ability to change and transform this nation. And I just hope we'll get out together so that we're going to get them done, and we should get them done. So I thank you for being here.